Hello, and welcome back to CST2120. So in this lecture, I'm going to be covering the document object model and event handling in JavaScript. So yeah, pretty simple structure, really. Um, uh, and these are kind of, it's really a very introductory lecture to this stuff. I'm just showing you how it works. I'm not going to go into all the sort of tiny little details of it. OK, so document object model. So what happens um, when the browser loads a page? And a page, in this case, consists of the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript. So what it does is it creates uh, its own kind of representation of that HTML, yeah? You know, which is kind of this tree structure um, showing all the different elements uh, that correspond to the HTML tags. And then the JavaScript, when, it wants, when you want to change this page using JavaScript, it interacts with the document object model. And when the document object model changes, then in turn the browser reloads the page. So this is general structure. We write a bunch of HTML with some CSS, and then the browser loads up that HTML and CSS, and it generates two things. Yeah, firstly it generates a sort of graphical representation of that HTML, what you actually look at when you look at the web page. That's here on the right, and at the same time it generates uh, the document object model which is a sort of computer sort of representation of what's going on in that HTML. Yeah? And so this markup is then converted into this document object model here. And then the JavaScript, um, it, it's not interacting directly with the graphical stuff that the user sees, the kind of pixels on the screen. It's interacting with this computer representation of the HTML with the document object model. So it kind of changes this stuff, reads off properties from this, this uh, document object model here. And whenever this changes, this will also change as well. So here's a sort of slightly closer look at this. So here's the, um, here on the left we've got the HTML, and here on the right we've got the document object model corresponding to that HTML. So the sort of the top level, the sort of root of this thing is always a document of some kind. And then we've got the kind of HTML, sort of is the next sort of level down in this tree. So we've got the HTML here and the closing HTML tag. So that corresponds to this part here of the document object model. Then inside the HTML, inside these two tags here, we have the head section and the body section. So here's the head, uh, head section here and the body section here. And obviously the head section then has further sort of branches, if you like, going down. This sort of tree structure or roots, depending on which way up it is. Um, in which you've got the meta, the title, and the script tag, and then each of these sort of leaves or branches on the tree uh, contains the sort of detailed stuff, like you know what the, what the content, what the attributes are of the meta tag or the contents of the title page here. In, the, in this case, my blog. Yeah. So you can see that this completely corresponds, assuming it's correct HTML, um, to the HTML um, that's that's been loaded by the browser. And then the JavaScript can use this representation of the HTML to manipulate and read off properties in the page and that kind of stuff, yeah? So I've already shown you one of the document object model methods, um, which is document get element by ID, that lets us access particular elements on the page by referring to their, um, their ID, right? So I showed you how you could use document get element by ID to get a JavaScript variable that points not to the HTML as it happens, but it points to a particular part of the document object model, a particular, you know, one of those parts of that tree, yeah? So we're getting a pointer to part of that tree that enables us to read parts, what's the attributes of that part of the tree, and also to change them if you want to. Um, so yeah, in this case, we're changing the inner HTML. So in this case, if we were changing the title, for example, the inner HTML of title would be changing this text here to my blog to something else, yeah? So document's a global object. We can just access that anywhere in our JavaScript code. Get element by ID is a method um, of this object. And inner HTML is kind of a property of the object that corresponds to the contents of the HTML element. So we've got a method returning a pointer to a part of the document object model. And, that, and then that part of the document object model has things like inner HTML that correspond to the inner HTML between, the, between those two tags. Now, one thing to be a little bit careful about, if you want to change the document object model, um, it's fine once the page is loaded and the user starts interacting, but if you want to make some changes that, that happen sort of straight away, so a typical example would be maybe you've got a slideshow you want to start up when the page loads. Um, so just be aware if you're trying to do that kind of stuff that the document object model only exists after the page has been fully loaded. So the browser's got to sort of go through all that HTML, build this document object model, and then it can allow you, and then when that, once that's built, you can then interact with it and read it, read from it. So if you've got JavaScript that's interacting with a document object model, you, might, you probably want to call that, if you want it to get going straight away, you probably want to wait until the window is loaded and then call that code. 
So, um, otherwise, the problem, you can get weird errors, kind of timing errors, that sometimes the code works, sometimes it doesn't, because, you know, maybe, you know, some bit of the, depending on where the script tag is, it might affect whether the JavaScript can, you know, access document object, that part of the document, um, and that kind of thing, yeah. So the sensible thing to do anyway is to put your code in a function and instruct that the browser to call that function when the window is loaded. This is sort of typical thing. You put all your initialization code into a single function and then call that function in response to an event that's triggered when the window is loaded. So this is the sort of original code I gave you, which will work fine most of the time because it's such a tiny bit of HTML. But if you had like a thousand lines of HTML, obviously it's going to take a while to build that document object model, even with a modern fast browser. So the usual way of doing it is, is we have a function, that, let's call it init, for example. Um, and this function then, and then we have window on load, that's an event that's triggered uh, when the window loads. I'm going to go into events much more detail in the second half of this lecture. So when this event happens, and what I'm telling it, telling the code here to do is when that event happens, call this function here init. So when, window, when the browser is completely load up document object model, it'll trigger this event, which will call this function, and then it'll do the changes that I want to do, like start a slideshow or something like that. So the document object model has lots and lots of different methods for accessing and manipulating different parts of it. Um, and if you get into jQuery, that's got, you know, similar things, but it's like you need to package yeah, and with nicer kind of query selectors and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so, you know, but the, the basic methods sort of out of the box, so to speak, you know, will do the job just fine if, if you know, you don't have to use jQuery. So, for example, just to give another example, we've got document elements by tag name returns um, an HTML collection of the elements with a specified tag name. So, um, so these document object model methods don't necessarily return sort of straightforward objects or straightforward arrays. They have their own kind of object types kind of associated with these different methods. Yeah. So in this case, this method here doesn't return an array. It returns an HTML collection. And the HTML collections will function like an array if, if you want to just access different part, different elements with uh, square brackets. But what it doesn't have is a for each method. So when I was you know, re revising these slides to re-record them. You know, I was I was fiddling around. I was trying why 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 isn't for each working? And reason for each doesn't work is because it's an HTML collection, which is different from your standard JavaScript array. But, but you can still use square brackets to access the elements by index, or there's ways of converting it into a standard array if you're desperate to use for each for some reason. So just to give you a little example, so here we've got a page, and the HTML this page has our header and then three paragraphs. So that's what it looks like. Extremely uninspiring page. And then here we've got our code here in our init method that calling this document get elements by tag name with a P. So it's going to get all of the elements here. Um, all, and there's lots of things like document forms, document image is if I wanted, I could use that too. But in this case, document get elements by tag name is what I want to use. And then I'm working through this HTML collection and accessing each of the elements um, using a for loop and then just accessing, accessing the elements using the index there. And so what that code does is just outputs the paragraph text um, that's here, but in JavaScript, right? So that I could change it as well if I wanted. Now, document, the document object model has many, many different methods. Yeah, I can do document anchors, document body, document cookie, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, there's many, many different ways in which I could pull the different parts of the page to access and manipulate them. And as I said, if you want to go even more crazy with that stuff, you can just use great jQuery or some of one of these other kind of frameworks, you yeah? know? So I'm not going to go into every single one of these. I could spend a whole term just going through these individual methods and it'd be very boring and you'd probably forget it immediately. Yeah. So the way, best thing to do is start off with the simple ones, like you can document get element by class name, I think, and document get element by D. Use the basic ones. And then as you need it, as you need to kind of add in, you know, learn a bit more about the document object model and add in the different bits that you need, you know, as you, as you go. Yeah. And there's pretty good documentation of all this. So, you know, just use, you know, learn it in a progressive way as what, as you get better at web development is, is what I'm recommending here. Okay. So that's the, the sorry, itchy nose. Um, so that's the, um, accessing, uh, parts of the document object model. So it's all very well being able to access them, but we want to typically, we want to change them in some way as well. Yeah. So one way of doing this is to use set attribute. This is quite a sort of general method. So for example, here we've got a, a pointer to part of the document object pointer to paragraph, right? And I want to change the class attribute of that paragraph, yeah? And that might be a useful thing to do. For example, if you wanted to highlight that paragraph in response to user action or something like that, then I can just change the class and then that'll change the styling of that particular element. And I can also use get attribute to get a specific attribute and unsurprisingly it returns null if the attribute doesn't exist. So this is uh, blah, blah, blah. So this is a 
not a very good example, but it shows you how to use attributes. So in this case, we've got a header here, and there's a style attribute associated with this. And then what I can do is I can set that, um, I can change that the style attribute to kind of color red, for example, if I want to make it go red. This is not the best way of changing the style, I'll explain a better way in a second, but it just shows you how you can change the attributes sort of dynamically using JavaScript. And this is a slightly better attribute example. So images, uh, two of the attributes that images have are width and height. So again, using JavaScript, we can change those images uh, width and height kind of dynamically if, if we want to, yeah? So here we've got, for example, a cat picture, which is just all, the, all that's in the page here. And then what I'm doing here is I'm getting a pointer to the cat picture, this my image thing here. And then here I'm dynamically changing the width and height, so it's sort of squishing it that way and sort of pull it, stretching it that way. I'll just show you how to do this, yeah? And what I'm going to do is I'm also going to do it in a debugger to make it just a tiny bit more exciting, yeah? So, um, it's, it's uh, <coughs> when you're programming, um, you often use console log or something like that to kind of output, you know, uh, the data um, and find out where you are in your program, that kind of stuff. That's okay. Um, I use it a lot myself. But if you've got problems with JavaScript or you want to have a much quicker way of looking what, to see, seeing what the code is doing, then it's well worth learning how to use a debugger a little bit. So I'll just go through this now to, I'll show you how the set attributes works in debugger just to try and make, you know, introduce, increase your familiarity with this, yeah? So if you go into sources, so usually we're using console, right, to see what's going on here. But if you go into sources, we can see all the sources of the page. Um, and then we can double click on a source to see the source code. Now, this source code is slightly funny because I'm running it in Visual Studio, a Visual Studio code. So all this stuff's been actually chucked into, into my page sort of dynamically. But I can still see the code of my actual page, which is here. This is my actual code. So I can still see that. It's just mixed up with some other stuff. So with a debugger, what I do is I've got the numbers down the side here. What I can do is click on click on a particular place and introduce what's called a breakpoint. And a breakpoint means that when the, the browser will execute the JavaScript code until it hits the breakpoint, and then it will pause. And then I can look inside the memory of the browser and see what variables it's got. And I can kind of step through um, the lines of code at my own pace, and then I can see how things are changing and what's happening, yeah? So that's the extremely powerful and useful thing about uh, using debuggers. So if we just refresh the page, um, and what we see here is we've got, it's paused at this particular point in the, in the code because that's where I've introduced the breakpoint here by clicking on the numbers, yeah? And now what I can do, I can step over next functions and step into, let's just stick with the basic usage here. So watch, I'm not using, you know, I think I introduced that in a previous, um, previous lecture, but we'll probably come back to it later. So what I could do is a resume script execution, in which case I'll just run all the way to, back to the end, past that breakpoint. That's not what I want to do here, so I'm going to refresh it again, and I can use step over. So if I step over that line of code, it'll execute that line of code, and then move on to the next one. So this one's just getting the generating my image, the sort of pointer to uh, the part of the document object model. And now I've got my image dot width. Now if I call step over, it's going to execute that line of code when I click this button here. So you can see now it's shrunk down the image by changing its width, yeah? And now if I step over the next line of code, it's then um, changed the height um, to 500, yeah? So you can see that this debugger is a very nice way in which we can step through the different lines of code and see exactly what they're doing on the page. And also by I could add watches or whatever, see what they're doing in memory. And then that enables me to sort of fix problems and understand things much more easily, yeah? Okay, so I think I'll take that out. Sometimes if you leave watch breakpoints in, that can be very confusing. Um, okay, so I showed you how you could do change style by doing calling set attribute. It's not the best way of doing it because document object model has a nice uh, style property associated with HTML elements, and I can use that in a much sort of easier way to change different style properties like color and you know font, all kinds of stuff. Anything anything that's defined as a CSS style property, I can change using the style object here. Um, we can also change the structure of the tree itself. Um, we can create elements, remove elements, append childs, replace childs, write new new things into the document in lots of different ways, yeah? So all I've been trying to do in the first half of this lecture, really, is just introduce you to the document object model, explains what it does, and show you, give you a sort of hint of the many, many powerful things you can do by interacting with document object model. So as I said, I'm not going to go through every single different method and property of the document object model. It'll be tedious and will tell you nothing because you just forget it because it's just so boring. But, you know, 
if you stick with web development for a while, you'll progressively use more and more of the features of it in different projects, and you'll just get more and more familiar with it in that way. To start off with, just stick with something basic like your element by ID, and use that with some kind of few jQuery selectors, and then start with that, and then build progressively, um, and develop your knowledge that way. So there's lots and lots of documentation on it. I mean, there's a sort of link there to the W3Skills documentation. Okay. So the next part of this lecture, final part of this lecture, I'm going to cover event handling in JavaScript. And again, it's going to be a fairly superficial treatment, just introduce you to the basics of listening for events and handling for event, handling events. And again, as you write more and more code, you'll get better and better at that and look more into the documentation and do more sophisticated things with events. So JavaScript's there for the dynamic HTML, right? It's there to react to events and do, do stuff in the browser. You know, long gone in the days when we just had a static HTML page with a bit of CSS on it, yeah? We want to do things with the page loads, with mouse clicks, mouse movements, timers, changes in document object model, and so on and so forth. Yeah? So the general terminology here is that when an event occurs, your code can handle it. Okay? To handle an event, you provide some code, and that code's called or invoked when the event occurs. So the code's called an event handler, so we, and the event handler is registered with the event that it handles. So we have events, we have code, and we connect the two together, the code is the handler, we connect the handler to the event by registering the event handler, so it's called um, in response to a particular event. So let's look, uh, so I've already shown you this once, right? So um, this is the kind of window unload stuff. So here, window unload is the event, it's triggered sort of automatically by the browser whenever the document object model is completely loaded. This will call here I'm registering, I'm instructing the browser to call this function, but I could also just put some code in as I'll show you later. So I'm instructing the browser to call, call this function or this code um, when this event occurs. So I'm, I'm registering this code with this, with this event here. Yeah? And so when that event occurs, um, it's gonna call all of the code inside my page load handler function. And HTML elements uh, can generate lots of different types of events, and these different types of events can be connected to handlers. As I said, there's a lot of detail here, but I'm not going to go into this detail in this lecture. Yeah, so we've got on change, on click, on mouse over, on mouse down, lots of keyboard events, and so on and so forth. Yeah, there's probably all kinds of crazy events linked to new features of HTML5 and all the rest of it. Yeah. So to handle events, um, there's two ways, and this is kind of the bad way, but it's worth knowing about because it's often used in uh, older code. And here we have attributes of the HTML element, yeah? So the attribute, we've got the ID attribute, but we've also got an on mouse over attribute and on mouse out attribute. And these um, attributes can be set to the value of those attributes is, can be either a function, in this case, it's a function call in this case, like mouse over, so it's calling a particular function, or I think um, I could probably put in curly braces or maybe even without a bunch of JavaScript code kind of pasted in there, but I, you, you wouldn't want to do that anyway, it's horrible. Um, but potentially that, that's something you could do. I haven't tried it, so I don't take that as, you know, 100% true, yeah? But it's not a, bad, not a good way of doing it anyway, but you'll often see this, yeah? So we've got attributes inside the HTML elements pointing to functions, and it's actually the function call. So it's actually going to execute this bit of code, which is going to call mouse over and execute the code inside the actual function. Yeah? So this is all right, but it's not great. Um, this is actually a much better way of doing it. So here we've got a particular HTML element, much, much cleaner as well, right? We've got here, we're mixing up our JavaScript code with the HTML, which is always a bad idea anyway. Here we have the HTML is just clean, it's just got IDs or classes, whatever it is. We're getting a reference to that piece of the HTML, part of the document object model. And then here, um, we're linking the events associated with those different parts of the document object model um, with bits of code, in this case, anom anonymous functions, yeah? So this is much better. Within our JavaScript code, we're then defining the relationship between events in the document object model and the code that's going to be called in response to those events, which is much better than mixing all this stuff up with the HTML, particularly when you're generating the HTML dynamically and dropping chunks of it from databases and all the rest of it. Yeah, this is definitely a superior way of doing this, yeah? So in this case, I'm saying when the header generates the... When this on mouse over event is triggered by the header, i.e. you put a mouse over the header, then it's going to call this code here, it's going to change the color to green, and when the, um, when, the mouse, when the mouse moves out of that element, it's going to change the color back to orange. <coughs> now, the other kind of event you're very typically going to handle, um, particularly in your projects and your coursework, uh, are keyboard events. So there's two sort of main ways of doing keyboard events. Yeah, so one, one way in which is when you're handling keyboard events for a specific element, yeah? 
Um, so typically you maybe got an input field in a form or something, someone's typing something in a form, and maybe you want to handle keyboard events so that you can um, make sure that they're entering the right kind of stuff. You might want to make sure they're typing numbers if they're entering numbers into a form, into a telephone number or something like that, yeah? Now the tricky thing about those kinds of events linked to specific HTML elements is that they'll only be triggered um, when the element has focus, yeah? At least key for keyboard events. Mouse events are a bit different. For keyboard events, only when that element has focus um, will it actually, will the keyboard event actually have, be responded to, yeah? So if I'm only listening for keyboard events on a, on a header, for example, then you're probably never going to get any events. I haven't tried this, but it's, you know, probably not going to work, yeah? And particularly if you want to play, um, if you want to uh, listen for keyboard events to play a game, which is kind of what you want to do a lot of time, you want to like use arrow keys to move a spaceship around or something like that, then if the canvas hasn't got focus, then you're not going to be able to listen for keyboard events on the canvas itself, yeah? So the other approach is to listen for keyboard events globally using a window object, yeah? So the window itself will generate keyboard events, um, which then probably will pa be passed down to the elements that have focus. So the keyboard events, um, so that's, this is probably the better approach if you're doing something like a game, and it's generally easier and more reliable than relying on the focus thing, except um, when you're typing things into a form when, when things are a bit different. So anyway, um, if you listen for them globally, um, then you can just call a, a function, um, just like any other event. So, yeah, so here's an example, right? So window, window on key down, whenever a key on key, whenever a key's pressed in the window, um, then you'll generate this particular event. Now with keyboard events, what you want to know is which key has been pressed. And you do that using this event object here. So you can call it what you like, but I've called it event. So the, many events, probably possibly even all events, um, when they call a function, one of the arguments of the function is an event object that has the information about the event. And this is particularly useful with keyboard events because this event object contains things like the key code, which causes so different key code associated with each of the different keys on the keyboard. And it'll also actually tell you explicitly what key has been pressed. So the easiest thing to sort of do, I think, is just illustrate this. So if we go to simple mouse demo, so, so you say that regardless of focus, so, so if this window's got focus, this thing's still working. So focus can be handled, you know, anyway, but this is the simple mouse over thing, which, you know, works very easily, nicely. So it looks slightly more interesting here. So again, so this is, uh, this is the keyboard handle I just showed you. So if I type into the console, right, Nothing happens, yeah? Because this is the part of the window that has focus. But then if we go to the browser window itself and kind of click on the browser window like that, then whenever I press a key, um, it's generating this keyboard event, which I'm just logging out. So the keyboard itself, so the event itself, you see here I'm, I'm logging, uh, where's it gone? Uh, yeah, the keyboard event, this is the event here. And eventually I'm just logging that as an object kind of thing, and I'm also logging the key code, yeah? So as I... Um, type in this window, I'm, I'm generating these keyboard events, and you can see that it tells me somewhere key, it's got an actually, uh, it's got a, a string description of the key, and also there's a uh, event.keycode gives me the thing, so if I, for, so for example, let me get back to focus here, so if I go arrow up, I can get a key code 38, arrow code let down, key code 40, left 37, right 39, yeah? So different keys generate different key codes, and often this, and I'm also getting key here, so whichever way you use it doesn't really matter, the important thing is, this information is contained inside the event. And so I can use it uh, in my code. So I can say here, for example, if key code or if key equals arrow left, um, then, you know, uh, move the spaceship left, call a function to move the spaceship left, something like that. So that for, in terms of producing games, um, this kind of stuff is extremely useful. Okay. So if you want some more reading, um, Java, modern JavaScript tutorials, got a lot of, you know, it's a really nice chapter on the browser, uh, the document object model, how that all works, and also how browser events work. So, you know, if you want to recommend it, have a little bit of a read through that or the equivalent stuff in eloquent JavaScript, if you prefer that book. Okay, so in this lecture, I've introduced document object model, uh, event handling. You know, you're going to use these all the time um, if you're doing dynamic web pages that are changing the page or reading stuff out of the page and so on and so forth. Yeah, you know, JavaScript event handling goes beyond the browser. When you get into Node, you know, you're going to do endless, you know, event handlers and triggers and this kind of stuff. Yeah, so they're just fundamental to JavaScript as a language. Yeah, but I've only covered the basics here because we need to get the basic concepts. And as I said, start with simple stuff like document get element by D and then progressively build your knowledge, possibly with the aid of a framework like jQuery or something like that. Okay.